Yeah, that's fine. If you can, uh, <coughs> sorry? thanks a lot. If you just if you can watch. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to kind of the very sincere and this fortunate event. We have two um, amazing guest speakers, and one of the reasons why we know they're amazing is because they have Wikipedia pages, um, and that's always a market. Carrie Lynn, you should have a, a Wikipedia page too. We'll have to get working on that. Um, before we get started, the theme of this week is allyship as, as citizenship. And I'm not going to bore you with stories of my youthful activism, um, but let's just say that uh, about 25 years ago, I wandered out of my technical diploma in renewable resources management at Selkirk College into a political science classroom uh, and was influenced by a, guy, a guy, by a guy by the name of Andy Shadrach who ended up running for the Green Party uh, and lives in Caswell. And the thing that Andy communicated to me was the importance of two things. One, dealing with climate change uh, was one, and more importantly, reconciling with the original peoples of this land that we're now inhabiting. Um, and so, I mean, I've been in and out for years and years and years, but I always kind of carried that with me. And so, of course, as a class, you sort of realize uh, there's a bit of serendipity in this as well. Um, it was 25 years ago. We don't have another 25 years. And it seems to me that everything's kind of aligning, uh, even in terms of the kinds of speakers that we have coming to the class, to take some real action here. And one of the ways that we, and maybe one of the strongest ways that we can take action, is to ally ourselves with marginalized, uh, uh, marginalized groups. Um, also, in the spirit of allyship, I want to I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. Uh, people, okay, uh, Six Nations, and, and we have Terry Lynn, awesome, thank you very much for, for coming out today, uh, and we had a great, two weeks ago, we had a great time down on Six Nations on Terry Lynn's farm, uh, learning about Indigenous agricultural practices, climate change, and a different notion of sustainability. Um, so without anything further, uh, I'd like to introduce you uh, Harsha Kualia, um, and I'm taking this from your your Wikipedia page, so I hope that's fine. So just so you know, it's not, my page. It's not your page, okay. Uh, but it's all very complimentary, uh, which is great. So uh, Arsha Wally is a social justice activist and journalist who is best known for co-founding the Vancouver chapter of No One Is Illegal. Wally's writings have appeared in over 50 harsh sorry, sorry, have appeared in over 50 journals, anthologies, and magazines, including Briar Patch, Canadian Dimension, Feminist Infused Magazine, Left Turn, People of Color, Organized Rattles, that magazine, and What We Dance, and others. She has contributed essays to academic journals, including Race and Class, as well as chapters in anthologies, Power of Youth, Youth and Community-Led Activism in Canada, Beautiful Trouble, A Toolbox for Revolution, and Organize, Building from the Local for, for Global Justice. She is, she is author of the book Undoing Border Imperialism, which Indigenous rights activist Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz has called the first extended work on immigration that refuses to make First Nations sovereignty invisible. Um, so, the topic that uh, uh, Harsha is going to be speaking on today is allyship of citizenship, uh, climate change, and migration. So, everyone, please welcome Harsha. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd also like to start by acknowledging that I and we are here on Haudenosaunee territories and extend my gratitude uh, to the peoples of this land, to the nations whose land we're here on today. I have to say that I'm here to walk in a good way, uh, to walk lightly, and to exchange and learn from all of you here. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, I've been asked to speak on issues of climate and migration. And you know, of course, right now, this is in a context of a very intense moment where climate change has been recognized as a global crisis and a global threat, and also at a time where the refugee crisis uh, is one that is unparalleled right now in the world, right? We're at a time where there are more people who are being forced off their land and who are becoming migrants than has ever been recorded since World War II. So we're in a, a massive crisis of displacement. So I want to talk about the connections between climate change and migration and people who are forced to move as a result of climate change. So by way of, of context, um, how I come to this work and how I come to these movements is uh, through my family history primarily. So my uh, grandfather was involved in fighting the British Raj, so in the you know, 1930s, 1940s, 1920s was involved in fighting the British Empire. 
Um, but shortly after that, uh, after the end of the formal British Raj, what happened in uh, India and Pakistan and in South Asia in the 60s and 70s especially was what was called the Green Revolution. Are folks here familiar with the Green Revolution somewhat? So the Green Revolution is the opposite of a Green Revolution, right? Never take <laughs> language by governments and corporations seriously. It was a completely ungreen revolution. What it was was massive industrial scale uh, agriculture being forced onto primarily subsistence farmers and land-based communities. So my mother's family were farming communities and land-based communities in the Punjab. And as a result of mega, mega agribusinesses like Monsanto coming in, as a result of monocropping, industrial farming, privatization of land, they were forced off their land, right? This is a trend that we see all around the world. And so uh, what the, in, what the um, Green Revolution did was force millions and millions of farmers into extreme poverty and destitution. And the kind of tip of that iceberg that we see right now is through the epidemic of farmer suicides in India that people might be familiar with. And so it's estimated that 11% of all suicides in the country are farmers who are committing suicide, right? So this is not an isolated incident. It is widespread, um, widespread impoverishment and loss of land, loss of livelihood, and people being forced into debt, into banks and financial institutions. And in one year alone, in 2004, there was over 18,200 farmer suicides in the country, right? In one year alone, over 18,000 farmer suicides. And so, uh, as a result of the Green Revolution, as a result of this um, intense, this intense privatization of land, commodification of land, uh, my family and you know, thousands and thousands of other families were forced off their land and into urban areas. And so this is uh, the kinds of, for me, the history that has brought me into a work primarily around land defense. And I use the frame and phrasing of land defense quite deliberately, uh, especially here on Turtle Island. I wasn't born here on Turtle Island, um, but I use it specifically uh, in solidarity and in alliance with indigenous land defenders because I think uh, the alternate framing, like environmentalism, uh, is one that doesn't speak to me personally. So it's not a critique that I offer to anyone else who identifies as an environmentalist, but for me I find it to be a really challenging frame and terminology for a few reasons. One is that, you know, historically the environmentalist movement has been largely privileged. It's been white, it's been middle class. It has not been inclusive to communities of color, to marginalized communities, to indigenous communities, to poor communities. But I think even when there has been a move to try to diversify, for lack of a better word, or to increase representation within the environmentalist movement, I think at its foundation, the environmentalist movement continues to perpetuate really colonial logics. And by that I mean the very frame of environmentalism, one that assumes and presumes that the environment is separate from the people, is a form of colonialism. Because that's precisely what terra nullius on these lands has and continues to be. So terra nullius, is the myth and the doctrine that these lands were barren. Uh, it's the myth of, and is the perpetuation of the idea of the doctrine of discovery, right? which is the idea that these lands were discovered by colonizers. And so those two doctrines um, have been legally enshrined. They've been politically enshrined. And in the United States and Canada, they have actually never officially been repudiated. And so this is not just a semantic debate. <coughs> what environmentalism does is continue to perpetuate the idea that there are no people on land, right? That there is an environment that needs to be protected, but the human ecology that makes up the environment becomes invisibilized within environmentalism. So even when we talk about environmental justice and social justice as two separate issues, we continue to make the divide between uh, you know, the human family and the non-human family, right? When in fact those are deeply connected. So uh, for me, I have never felt comfortable with uh, both the way, with uh, not only the ideology of environmentalism, but also within its working. So I think that's why we always see an uncomfortable tension between land defense all around the world and environmentalism as a dominant movement, um, is, is the way it's structured. And so, you know, that being said, so I, I speak about um, land defense, and for me, it's impossible to talk about climate change without talking about humans, not the on the land without talking about marginalized communities who continue to subsist on the land, whose very identity is based on the land. Um, and also that it's impossible to talk about climate change without addressing the root issues and the root causes that both perpetuate climate change and also mean that climate change disproportionately impacts certain communities, right? So we live 
under political systems, economic, social, um, economic systems, and social systems, that means that some people are more impacted by us than others, despite being the least responsible for climate change, right? That's, that's something that we know. Um, and that kind of asymmetry is also very similar when we look at the refugee crisis or the migrant crisis and the crisis in displacement, right? So those who are mostly being forced off their lands are people who are predominantly brown and black communities, right? It is not predominantly white communities who are being forced off their land. People who are facing uh, immense danger when people are trying to flee for their safety are predominantly poor people, not rich people, right? And so even though there is all kinds of movement around the world, the kinds of movements that are criminalized are those that are of people who are trying to come from the global south to the global north. Right? If people carry a Western passport and want to travel around the world, it's pretty easy to do that. It's pretty easy to do that with a fair amount of safety and luxury and comfort, right? But if you're coming from the Global South into the context of the Global North, you're not a tourist. You're not welcome, right? You're, you're faced with uh, immense danger. We're seeing that in the Mediterranean with over 16,000 deaths in the span of a few years. Like, that is immense. Um, or you're thrown into jails and detention centers. So, the asymmetry of both of these crises, I think, revealed to us that we, we live in a deeply unequal world. Um, and so at the nexus of this issue is the issue of climate migrants, right? People who are being forced off their land as a result of, of climate change. Um, and so uh, uh, the International Organization for Migration, which is an international body uh, that regulates and monitors migration and displacement all around the world, estimates that there's over one billion people who are forced off of their land and forced out of their communities across the planet. Out of that, approximately 26.4 million are what we call climate refugees. So climate refugees are people who are forced off their land as a result of climate-induced disasters or natural hazards. And so 26.4, you know, when we start talking about millions, it all starts to sound fuzzy, right? It's like, it's like whatever, one million, six million, it starts to sound the same. But what that is, is one person every second. One person every second is forced to flee their land, is forced out of their home community, no longer has access to their livelihood as a result of climate change. And that, uh, that number, one person every second, is almost 40% more than it was just four years ago. So the scale of displacement has increased very rapidly. So there's been an increase of 40% just in the past few years. Um, and again, these are very asymmetrical, right? The kinds of communities that are displaced off their lands are, are not rich, are mostly not white, and are mostly in the global south. And so um, one, of those, one of those communities is uh, Tuvalu. Are folks familiar with Tuvalu? So Tuvalu is a low-lying Pacific island. And it has been um, estimated that Tuvalu is going to entirely submerge in a few decades. Don't let that sink in, right? Entirely submerged. An entire country is about to submerge as a result of sea levels rising, okay? One-fifth of people in Tuvalu have already been forced to flee their lands. One-fifth. And the president of Tuvalu has at every single United Nations climate negotiation, every single time, brought up this issue at the international level, right? That our people are dying, our people are being forced off the land, and the international community needs to do something. And the uh, closest neighboring Western country to Tuvalu is Australia. And in the entire world, actually, Australia has the largest CO2 emissions per capita. So per capita. It's the highest rate of CO2 emissions. And so is largely responsible, as are other Western countries, right? Canada is, is fluctuates between the third and fifth most responsible for climate change. Um, is one of the most responsible for climate change, but refuses to accept, to this date, has not accepted a single person from Tuvalu into Australia as a climate refugee. Right? There is a horrendous amount of um, racism in that. There's a horrendous amount of injustice in that, but the world can sit and watch as an entire community and an entire country is about to be submerged, right? And we're able to create that distance, the idea that this doesn't impact us, that it's happening somewhere else, because we don't face that reality, because those folks don't look like us, because we have no sense of connection to those who we think are others. Right? <coughs> so there's a comfort in that. Um, 
And you know that this Tuvalu is not alone in this. There are entire countries, low-lying countries, uh, coastal communities, right? The Philippines, Bangladesh, all parts of you know North and Western and Southern Africa are all dealing with this. And so, leading up to the climate negotiations that are coming up in Paris in a few weeks. One of the things that the LDC block has done, so the LDC is the least developed country block, as they're called, and the LDCs have been working on a series of recommendations addressing climate change and the refugee crisis. And what the LDC communities and countries have come up with is one main key recommendation, and that is that there needs to be a climate change coordination, a climate change displacement coordination facility, and that facility needs to deal with two main things. One is making sure that LDC countries in particular, uh, and those that are most vulnerable to climate change, despite being the least responsible for it, are not, are able to stay in their home communities, right? So that there needs to be an acknowledgement of international financing rooted in the principles of climate debt, right? That the West owes a debt to the South. Um, and that there needs to be climate technologies that are, um, that integrate <coughs> climate, what's called climate adaptation technologies, right? So that communities need to be able to stay in their home communities and not be forced into complete submersion or drought or famine. The second part of this facility is to make sure that those who are forced to flee because their lands are no longer inhabitable have a safe way to migrate, right? So that people aren't dying in the ocean, right? Um, and so these are the two key aspects of this climate change coordinate, climate change displacement coordination facilities that LDC's countries have been working on for over a year, right? So communities, entire countries have been working on this for a year. A few weeks ago, this recommendation was entirely removed from the draft agreement. So again, imagine the one main recommendation that an entire block of countries is putting forward is not even on the table. It's not even that Western countries and you know uh, countries with wealth are willing to even negotiate it. They're saying it's not even on the table. The things that matter to the least developed countries in the global south who are essentially facing extinction is something that we're not even gonna talk about. Again, there's an immense indignity to that. There's an immense um, perpetuation of a history of colonization and imperialism by the global north towards the global south. That is evident in that, right? Um, and so, you know, the LDC countries are left with, with nothing, right? Where, to the point where there are entire countries who are, on, who are on the verge of refusing to go to the climate talks. And there's the example of Yeb Sano, for example, who was one of the primary negotiators at the climate talks for the Philippines a few years ago. I don't know if folks saw him, but two years ago when Typhoon Haiyan, or it's, as, it called, as it's called in the Philippines, Typhoon uh, Yolanda, when it hit the Philippines, climate negotiations were going on at the time. And Yeb Sano, like, broke down in tears at the United Nations and said that, you know, these climate talks do nothing for our people. They do nothing for our people. Millions of people have been forced off their land, have drowned, have died, and the international community does not care about us. And he went on a hunger fast. 200 other delegates, mostly from the global south, joined him. And he has since quit the climate talks. Right? So chief negotiators for entire countries are no longer participating in these climate talks because they see them as a farce and as a perpetuation of you know, ongoing imperial tendencies and patterns between the global south and the global north. And this, is, you know, this isn't just over there and all around the world, this is also the case for Canada. Um, and one of the things that, uh, you know, that I remember really vividly, there's many ways in which we can talk about Canada's complicity, you know, complicity in climate change. The tar sands, as I'm sure will be brought up in a bit, uh, is one key part of that, and if I have time, I'm going to return to the, to the tar sands. But and with respect to climate refugees, you know, I remember a few years ago. Did, has anyone heard of the show Border Security? You heard of it, show? It's a horrible show. <laughs> it's basically for folks who don't know. It's entertainment porn, um, and well, that's not the right word to use, but uh, it's it's exploitative porn. If I can use that more accurately, but what it is is it shows like um, the cop show on Fox News in the United States, where it glorifies law enforcement and really makes it seem like law enforcement is just going out to get bad people. Really, at a basic level, violates people's privacy, right? Because you have no option about whether you want to be on this show or not, and glorifies an entire industry that's based around law enforcement. So border security is a show that follows a bunch of cameras follow around Canada Border Services Agency conducting raids against migrants. 
and, and you know, arresting and detaining migrants. And so whether or not, you know, because we don't have the time to get into the politics of deportation and detention, but whether or not people agree that there should be deportation and detention, I hope we can in the very least agree that these are things that should not be filmed and that should not be exploited, and that people in vulnerable situations cannot be filmed without their consent, right? Like that's a very, that's a minimum that, that we can agree on, I would hope. Um, so one of the things that, that came about as a light of the show is that there was a raid that was being conducted a few years ago on a workplace site, on a construction site in Vancouver that was being filmed. Um, and we found out about this raid as a result of, of it being filmed. And so uh, No One Is Legal, which is an all-volunteer migrant justice group that I work with, was then in touch with some of the migrants and their families and with detainees who are now incarcerated. And so when we went to talk to some of these men, a few of them in particular were from Honduras, and when we asked them, you know, what's your story, right? Because we don't have to find out. All we hear about is illegals and people who are incarcerated. We don't actually know what their story is. So we asked them, you know, what's your story? What brought you here? Why are you here? So two of the men who were cousins told us that the reason that they came to Canada was because they were facing destruction as a result of a Canadian mining company, Barrett Gold, that operates in Honduras. And their uncle had actually been killed by paramilitaries, right, because that is part of what happens with mining companies. Just by way of a side note, I don't know if folks know, but Canada is complicit in four times more human rights violations, or Canadian mining companies, sorry, are complicit in four times more human rights violations than any other country on the planet when it comes to mining. And so Mining Watch, which is a global organization that works on mining issues, has documented the specific horrendous um, climate crimes and, in, and uh, human rights crimes that Canadian mining companies commit. Which is why, you know, a lot of folks, you know, there's this old myth that if you go to parts of the global south with your Canadian flag on your backpack, people are going to treat you really well. If you go to certain parts of, of Central and South America, if you have a, you know, people literally are told now by development agencies and aid agencies to not put the Canadian backpack or Canadian flag on their backpack, right? Because it is, it is known that Canada's mining companies in particular are some of the primary violators of human rights in these countries. And so, uh, so their uncle, coming back to these uh, these two folks, these two cousins, these two brothers, their uncle was um, was killed by paramilitary assassination, through paramilitaries and private security guards hired by Barrett Gold and the company and the country to ensure that Barrett Gold could continue its investment in Honduras despite local opposition, right? Despite local opposition to this mining company. So they fled to Canada thinking that they could claim refuge, claim asylum. And what did Canada do? Same as what Australia has done, is refuse to accept them. Right? Canada refused to accept that they had a legitimate story, that they legitimately needed safety. And Canada basically denied that this was happening in Honduras, despite the fact that there is more evidence against Barrett Gold than probably, you know, probably any other single mining company on the planet. Like, you can find more about Barrett Gold than any other mining company, um, other than Gold Corp, probably. And so, you know, they ended up being refused, they became undocumented because Canada refused to accept them, and that's how you know, they ended up eventually in detention, ended up being arrested. So there are stories of people here in our home communities who face this kind of environmental and human rights violations constantly, um, but our governments refuse to accept them as refugees, which is not surprising because we know that if our governments actually refuse to even admit that climate change is real, or at least the intensity of it is real, without just token gestures, then we know that they're of course gonna deny the reality of climate refugees as well, right? Um, and so this is, this is a really um, important issue for folks to realize that this is happening here. And right now, you know, the other kind of convergence around the issue of climate change and displacement is Syria, for example, right? So Syria is in a, is in a as we know, is in a state of crisis, is in a state of intense civil war and violence. But one of the few things that's talked about is the way in which climate change has been a contributing factor. So no way, in no way has it been the driving factor necessarily. But all forms of displacement are in some way related to land and climate. So in Syria, seven years prior to the Civil War, there was a period of intense drought that American scientists have linked to climate change, right? A period of intense drought. And during this period of intense drought, over 75% of Syrian farmers lost their land and livelihood and livestock. 70% of Syrian farmers lost their land, their livelihood, and their livestock. 
This, you know, is not a surprise that it would intensify social conflict, that it would intensify scarcity, it would intensify uh, the move and displacement of people from rural areas and land-based areas and land-based communities into urban areas, which also <coughs> intensifies social conflict, right? So that is, that is one of the precipitating driving factors that's contributing to the climate, to the Syrian crisis, the refugee crisis in particular. Um, and in the past 24 hours, what we've seen, especially in light of the attacks in Paris, is that all around the world, there has been a move to now shut down borders to Syrian refugees, right? Because there has been this alleged link being made between the, the Paris attacks and Syrian refugees. So, um, and this happens every time there's an attack, particularly in countries of the West, the kind of racial profiling that emerges, the intense Islamophobia that emerges, the entire labeling of a community in its entirety as terrorist is really problematic, right? We know that that is a form of racism. When there are attacks, uh, you know, when, I don't know, I don't know if folks are, are <laughs> were born at the time, um, you know, but when there was, do folks know Timothy McVeigh? No, okay, I'm getting old. <laughs> so, you know, there are many examples, Timothy McVeigh being one of them, the incidents that happened in Norway more recently is another. Um, but whenever there are examples, or the Oak Street, the Oak Creek Gurdwara, right, in, in Wisconsin, whenever there are examples of massive murders or massacres or forms of violence that take place by, you know, white men who enact murder on other people, it's rarely called an act of terrorism, right? We know this, we know that this is an immense discrepancy that exists, that those are acts of a, a lone individual, those are an act of one person, um, you know, and it becomes individualized, right? That there's an act, that, that there's an act being committed by an individual. Um, and you know, all white folks are not suddenly responsible for speaking for white supremacy, right? Or white supremacists. People are not asked to make excuses for the crimes of other white folks. But whenever there's an act of violence that, you know, is either for real or allegedly, well, oftentimes it's alleged, committed by a person of color, by black folks, by Muslims, by Arabs, by South Asians, by, you know, any person of color, suddenly the entire community is responsible for that act of violence, right? Which is why now we have, we see Muslims being asked to condemn terrorism as if they're somehow responsible for someone across the planet that you've never met, you know? So there's an immense amount of violence in that. Uh, there's an immense amount of racism in that. And that racism is not just abstract. It, it plays out in ways where then we shut down borders to refugees. So, you know, up until a month ago, as a result of refugees' resistance and refugee rights organizing, there has been a push for governments to open up doors to Syrian refugees, and not just Syrian refugees, but all refugees, right? Because there isn't just one place where people are being displaced. And now, as a result of what's happening in Paris, there's a shutting down of borders. I don't know if people saw, but in the past 24 hours in Canada, there's been at least three petitions that are going around with over 100,000 signatures saying that we cannot allow refugee terrorists into Canada. Despite the fact that in North America, there's been over one million refugees in the past four years, and not a single one of them has been a terrorist, right? Yet we can somehow label an entire community and population as potential terrorists, despite there being no substantiation of that fact, and despite the fact that it's deeply racist, right? And so we're seeing, we're starting to see a shutdown of borders, where people are, you know, closing our borders, closing our hearts to the reality of massive displacement all across the planet, which again is not just an act of generosity or an act of charity, but it's an act of responsibility. It's an act of responsibility because again, we are responsible, right? Our governments are responsible for why people across the world are fleeing for their safety. Canada has until recently been engaged in a bombing campaign on Syria, right? Uh, and so Trudeau has talked about removing fighter jets, but there continues to be um, a bombing campaign. NATO has started engaging in a bombing campaign in Iraq in the past 24 hours. Like, we're living in a state of war, right? We're living in a state of war across the planet and here on Turtle Island, right? Um, and so it's an, it's an act of, of responsibility for us to understand that accepting refugees is part of what we need to offer as part of reparations for what the West has been doing to the global South, right? It's an act of reparations and an act of reconciliation at a global level. Um, and I don't have time to talk about it, 
Uh, but I will just briefly mention that, you know, so war and climate change are connected, you know, Syria being one example, but also economic violence and climate change are connected, right? So the kinds of economic, the kinds of degradation that happens when we privatize land. So for example, what happened to my family in the Punjab, what happens when we put land up on the market, when we start treating land and air and water, not as, you know, the sacred cultural assets that they are, that don't belong to us, right? That, that belong to the earth that belong to future generations, that is something we have inherited from our ancestors. When we start to see land as a commodity that we can put a price to, that we can trade and sell and place value on, that's when we start to see immense ecological devastation, right? Because we no longer understand what it means to protect the land. We start to, we start to think that we own the land. Corporations start to think that they can own the land, but we also start to believe as individuals that we can own the land, which we can't, right? We belong to the land. We belong to the land. We are all part of the land. Um, and by that I mean broadly, but you know, of course here on Turtle Island, folks who are non-indigenous are settlers to the land and indigenous peoples are from these lands, right? Um, and at a global level, the world's projects that are funded by the World Bank, so the World Bank is this massive in international institution that really puts forward a project of privatization. It's been estimated that in the past decade alone, 3.4 million people have been displaced from their land as a result of World Bank funded projects, right? So there's so many reasons why people are being forced off their land and it's not a coincidence. It's as a result of systems that we live under and that we continue to uphold. Um, and so I don't have time to talk about the tar sands. I, had, I wanted to talk, talk about it. Um, maybe in 30 seconds what I will say about the tar, the tar sands. Um, there's a few things. So one is that we know that the tar sands is a climate crime, right? And that Canada is home to this massive industrial project uh, that is devastating the planet. But I think there's a few things we need to keep in mind when we talk about the tar sands and we talk about its connection to broader systems, right? So that again, it's not just a climate crime that's existing in isolation from other systems that are happening and that we live under. So the first is of course, is that the tar sands is disproportionately impacting indigenous communities and indigenous nations, right? Lubicon Cree, Athabasca Chippewan First Nations, Beaver Lake Cree Nation, Dene communities are all being disproportionately impacted by the tar sands. Those are their lands. And I think we all know in Canada, whether it's explicitly said or not, the whispered subtext is that if the communities that were living downstream from the tar sands were middle class white urban communities, this, the scale of devastation would not take place, right? That the tar sands is not just a climate crime, it's also a form of environmental genocide, right? It's a form of industrial genocide that is based on, again, colonialism. Like the fact that we think, that we believe that indigenous people can continue to be made expendable, right? That they can continue to be sacrificed, that indigenous lands and people can continue to be sacrificed for capitalist production. Um, so we can't talk about the tar sands without acknowledging settler colonialism, right? That this is an enactment and a perpetuation of colonialism against indigenous nations. Uh, the second is that there is a clear link between the tar sands and the military industrial complex. So, you know, a lot of times we're led to believe that the reason that the tar sands continues is because there's demand for it and all we need to do is stop driving cars because we're all dependent on oil and we're all part of the problem. And that's true, right? Like we all have an individual role to play in ending our dependency on fossil fuels. But the single largest um, importer of tar sands oil is the United States. It's also not China, which is a whole other thing, right? The ways in which the boogeyman has become Asia. But the single largest importer of tar sands oil right now is the United States. And the single largest consumer of oil in the United States is the U.S. Department of Defense, right? So the U.S. Department of Defense that continues to wage war across the world in places like Palestine, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, all around the world, the victims of those wars are also the victims of the tar sands, right? So at the source, we have indigenous communities who are being sacrificed for tar sands production. And at the end, we have also brown communities who are being sacrificed as a result of wars that we're waging across the planet, right? So the mil we can't talk about um, climate justice without demanding an end to wars because wars are primarily what fuel oil sands and tar sands production. Um, the third thing, super quick, is the issue of migrant workers, right? The people who are working in the tar sands, the people whose labor is being exploited, people who are dying in the tar sands. Every single year, there are stories of workers who die in the tar sands. 
But I would argue the reason that we primarily don't hear about it is because they're migrant workers. They're migrant workers who are deemed not Canadian, and so when they die in the tar sands, their bodies are shipped out of Canada. Their, their families have to often pay for their bodies to be shipped out of Canada, right? And it's something that we just don't see. And in one year alone, in Alberta, there was over 800 complaints by migrant workers. So migrant workers are, you know, workers that are brought in from other parts of the world to do cheap labor, to do hard work, to do dangerous work, to do the really, you know, in the context of the tar sands, to do the work that is not the fancy engineering work, but like the actual work in, you know, tailings ponds and in this, in the bottom of the pits. There was 800 complaints by migrant workers in one year alone to the Alberta government. But because those folks were not Canadian, the Alberta government said that labor standards, basic labor standards, basic health standards, basic safety standards did not apply. Right? So we, again, can't talk about climate change without talking about the conditions of vulnerable workers who are forced to do the most dangerous work that there is. So not only is, so again, you know, we can't talk about the climate as destroying the land without talking about those folks who are forced to work the land. Because in some cases, again, there's a cruel irony that people are made migrant workers because their own lands are being destroyed halfway across the planet, right? So there's this vicious cycle. Um, and the last thing is the ways in which resource extraction impacts violence on women, right? Communities that are forced to live near resource extracted projects have all across the world reported increased rates of violence against women. And in BC, where I live, and in Alberta, which are resource extracted heavy economies, there has been an increase in violence, particularly against indigenous women. So we know that we live in a country where 